Good afternoon to you all. Good morning or good evening, depending on what part of the world you are. I am Margarita Lopez Maya. I am a Venezuelan historian. And at the moment, I am the president of LASA. And I am very pleased today to open a LASA dialogue on a case on the case of Venezuela. With this is going to be a conversation between professors Abraham Loventhal, David Smiley, and myself. The topic of the LASA dialogue today is on Venezuela 2023 change, ch uh, changing, charting a new course. This is a report that has that was uh, published recently by Professor Abraham Loventar. And that is, um, that's the topic that we want to discuss today. This, this LASA dialogue is the seventh that we have done as the team of the, pres as, of the, of the uh, Congress in Vancouver. This, that will be held this May. Uh, and uh, we have done all these series of LASA dialogues in order to prepare for the main topic of the Congress that is de um, democracy and human rights. So first I, I will introduce those, my, my, the people that I, we have invited, Professor Abraham Loventa doesn't need too much presentation. He is very well known in the fields of academia and also in the public. He holds a PhD of Harvard University. He is Professor Emeritus of the, the Pacific Council of International Relations and the Southern University of California. He has had a very long and productive academic and public uh, career, but I want to mention that among the many posts that he has had, that he is a co-founder of the Inter-American Dialogue and is a founder of the program of Latin America of the Withrow Wilson Center. Um, Professor David Smaldi, is a so, as an American sociologist. He holds a PhD of University of Chicago. He, his position is here in the University of Tulane. And he is an expert in Venezuela and a senior advisor of the Washington Office for Latin America. So very welcome, both professors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margarita. Well, today we're going to talk about a, a, a case that really has a uh, case in the, in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean, in a country that has passed through an astonishing transformation in a few decades. It has passed from being one of the most modern, wealthiest, equal and democratic societies to becoming one of the most backward, unequal, poor, and authoritarian uh, countries in the region. The numbers have been published many times, but it, and there's it, and there is abundant literature about what the United Nations has called a uh, humanitarian emergency crisis. But I want to point out some numbers to illustrate and put into context what we're going to talk about today. Venezuela has shrunk its economy to one fourth of what, of what it was 10 years ago. That means that today, Venezuela's economy is, is in the rank of a Central American country. Venezuela's people are the, what, of the poorest of the region and of the world, according to, to, to analyses of conditions of life, because there's no official data. Around 90% of the Venezuelan families today are poor. As for the oil industry, that was once one of the most uh, important of the region, together with Petrobras, Petrobras, the Brazilian oil company, were the two big oil companies in the world, in, in the region. Well, today it, it is in complete bankrupt and it is producing more or less one fourth of what it produced before the Chavez administration. We used to produce in Venezuela around more than 3 million of the uh, Iranians, we are producing around 700 barrels a day. 
I think this can be summarized also with the, with the, 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 the numbers that the United Nations gives on the Venezuelan migration that has more than 7 million of Venezuelans have fled the country in what has been the most massive migration that the region has known. Uh, we, are a pop we were a population of around 30 million people. 7 million is a very massive immigration. Well, as you, can, as you may see the context the day of the daily life of the Venezuelans that are, are, are in the territory is one of confrontation and violence. It's a very difficult situation. Polarization has been present all this time, but I would say the polarization has been uh, weakening because if you look at the surveys today in Venezuela, it, depending on the survey you look at, between 70, 75, sometimes even 80% of the people answer that they want a political change. However, this political change looks far in the horizon. Today, what we see is a, an authoritarian regime with totalitarian and sultanic traits that is consolidated in power. Even though there are some recent developments that may change this perspective that I, have, I was looking at last week. But nevertheless, it is, a, it is a dictatorship that has been consolidated. And on the other part, what we see is democratic actors, political parties, and uh, organizations of civil society that look weak and fragmented, and in many cases have been disconnected from the society in itself that is struggling for survival. S said this, <clears throat> However, I, I would like to, to say that the, 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 the democratic forces in Venezuela until recently have had developed a whole series of strategies and tactics and measures in order to, in what I call a zero sum game, to try to get out of this situation and produce a context in which we could go into a democratic transition and rebuild a democratic system. This, this meant all kinds of strategies that have been since mobiliz massive mobilizations, waves of protests, um, tables of negotiation, extra constitutional strategies and tactics, high school that has. However, after years of developing this, this kind of a strategy and tactics, we can consider that this has failed. And for about a year now, maybe a year and a half, in some cases, even some actors, two years, there has been the shaping of, of trying to shape a new strategy and new tactics to see if it is possible to, for, the for the Venezuelan society to get out of this such dramatic situation and, and try to fetch a democratic transition. So the book of Abraham Loventhal that we are going to talk about today has to do with a new strategy, the strategy of a gradual, peaceful, and negotiated path uh, between the, the authoritarian regime and the democratic forces in order to see if the, 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 the humanitarian emergency crisis can be overcome in a way. So I think I would leave it like that. Uh, this is uh, something that has been sh in the sh shaping that it, more and more actors are beginning to be convinced that this is uh, that this may be a way out of the Venezuelan crisis. However, there still is a lot of skepticism about it. But the book that Abraham Loventhal is presenting, Venezuela 2023, uh, charting a new course systematizes the ideas, the diagnosis, the arguments why this is the path that is viable, desirable, and probably the only game in town. So we will begin then our conversation. And I, I, I'm going to allow myself to ask a first introductory uh, question that has to do with a book that 
Professor Lowenthal and a Chilean politician, Sergio Bitar, published some years ago in 2015. That is, I think it's a key, it's a key and a very important book for the Venezuelan case. It is called Conversations with uh, Democratic Transitions, Conversations with Leaders of the World. And it's a very interesting book because it is a set of 13 interviews with key actors, political presidents, politicians, that in the five continents of the world uh, were placed, were able to, to, to conduct their countries, their societies into a democratic transition. So my first question, Professor Lovental, with those cases that you and Sergio Vitar uh, inter interviewed and put in that book that is so interesting and so important for, I think, to reflect on the Venezuelan case, is that do, do you find affinities? What kind of affinities do you find in, in which countries? Uh, remember, you have Mexico there, you have uh, Chile, Chile is there, Indonesia, and some other countries. Which would you think have affinities with Venezuela? And what lessons can, be, can we learn from, from, from those cases? Thank you very much, Margarita. Uh, let me, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, sharing this discussion and, and hosting it. And it's very important that uh, LASA's membership uh, uh, be involved in thinking about the Venezuelan case uh, and not uh, making it become even more isolated uh, over the next years. Um, the, the book that uh, Sergio Bitar and I uh, edited and uh, developed uh, all the material for, uh, based on an invitation from International Idea, uh, was an attempt to capture uh, the real lived experience of a number of uh, political figures around the world in different kinds of countries who all had a shared characteristic that they had played important roles in the transitions from authoritarian governments of different types to uh, d democratic uh, uh, governance uh, with uh, regular and uh, reasonably uh, orderly and fair elections uh, with uh, 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 separation of powers with uh, 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 the possibility of alt alternability uh, in power uh, with, uh, uh, the, uh, with the uh, rights of, of participation and, and uh, uh, free speech and assembly and so on that are absolutely requisite for democratic governance uh, in different countries in the world. And they were very different from each other. And they all succeeded in different ways, reaching democratic governance defined as I just did, which is not just a personal definition, it's really the Robert Dahl classic definition of democratic governance. Um, and asking ourselves, are there lessons that can be drawn uh, that might be of relevance in one or another or several uh, future situations, including we weren't thinking yet uh, in, in detail about uh, the current situation in Venezuela, but including Venezuela as well as many other cases. And what we find is less, it's less easy to discuss it in terms of affinities uh, than, in, than in terms of uh, uh, some recurrent challenges that even though the, the, the different authoritarian regimes were different from each other, those who wanted to change it and to move toward democratic governance had to face the same kinds of challenges, uh, looking at it from different angles. And that these recurrent challenges were responded to in similar ways that pr provide a kind of toolkit for thinking about how you make the transition from authoritarian regime to democracy. And the place to start is to understand it's not just Venezuela, it's all these authoritarian situations. It is inherently implausible that an authoritarian regime 
will lose power and be replaced by a democratic regime because the authoritarian regime has a monopoly or near monopoly of force. It has control of all government programs. It has control of the resources of the country. Uh, it is, it, it, it's in, inherently difficult to displace it. This is not just in Venezuela, it's everywhere. And so in all the situations that we faced, uh, it, it discussed, uh, analyzed, researched, and interviewed the leading figures. Uh, there were situations in which people were very pessimistic about the ability to change the situation. Uh, and there were, uh, there, there were zigzags, there were failures, there were, there, there were periods of great uh, 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 dissatisfaction and disappointment. And yet they all had a common positive outcome. Not all such situations do have a positive outcome, but we looked at enough cases, nine in, in uh, all the different continents, as you say, where it was successful to be interested in, in understanding how. And I think we did learn some things, which I will just mention a few of them and, and in a superficial way, because this is, a, this is a detailed book and we have very limited time. But I think the, one of the things was that over time, the opposition had to learn how to become more united and it had to look for opportunities to have an influence on reducing the degree of unity of the governing coalition. Unite the opposition, divide the authoritarian regime. Now, that, there's not a simple, easy way to do either. But if you know that to succeed, these things have to happen, it gives you some guidelines for uh, things you want to, to work on. Uh, when it comes to uh, the unity of, of, of the opposition, we also learn from several cases that even when you want to unite the opposition to have the strongest possible opposition grouping to challenge the authoritarian regime, you have to be careful that there, you, you don't become subservient to trying to meet every different agenda of the opposition. You have to have some real consensus on a central agenda. And you have to watch out for those who are willing to use any tactics to, to get their point of view pushed forward. The kind of maximalists who are looking for a situation that is very difficult, the most difficult to achieve, need sometimes to be uh, 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 persuaded to, to join the majority uh, in, in a uh, consensus more uh, pragmatic and more incremental way, rather than thinking that it can go hop, skip and jump right into the democratic leadership. And that's a hard lesson to learn and to implement. But if you think of Aylwin in, in Chile, for example, uh, he was hated by the socialists because he had been part of undermining Allende, uh, a very effective politician in the opposition to Allende. Uh, but he eventually became the leader of the United Chilean Opposition, uh, the Concertacion, uh, because he worked very hard at winning the confidence of the socialists uh, and the other parties in, in Chile, yeah. rather, rather than dismissing them. Uh, we, we also learned that you have to figure out a way, even, even in a situation where you on the opposition face the armed forces as an enemy, because the armed forces is the instrument of pressure, the armed forces, the security services in general, including the police, they are the, they are the hard edge of the authoritarian regime. It's hard, hard to make friends and peace with them uh, that, that's something that is not going to happen easily. But you have to figure out a way uh, to develop uh, a sense of respect for the security institutions, which will have to last. 
And you have to find a way to begin winning some confidence there. Right. You also cannot expect that simply discrediting the authoritarian regime will lead to its failure. You have to give a lot of attention to building up on the opposition side a plausible, believable, and attractive vision of what the country will look like in the future and of what the strategy is for reaching that goal. That's very difficult to do because some of, uh, of what is happening in these situations, and Venezuela is a classic case, is that the opposition may get discouraged. Uh, and some people who were previously eager to try to help produce a transition get tired and leave the ranks and want to think about anything else, maybe move somewhere else, or even if they stay in the country, not to be involved in politics and so on. That's, that's all very difficult. Uh, but you, you have to uh, uh, try to d develop both a long-term attractive vision and contribute to significant improvements in day-to-day -day life, even if that means cooperating with the uh, authoritarian regime. Now, this is where we are in the Venezuelan situation right now. Yeah, it's very, very interesting, Professor. I think I'm going to pass the, to David, if he has a question there, to, to advance a little bit on this, sure. on this context. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. And thank you, Abe, for participating in this. This is a, a, a great opportunity. And and your your ending comments there, I think, are a nice segue into into the question that I have. And, and this is, you know, we've, we've talked uh, a lot over the over the years, you and I. And of course, I, I talk a lot with Venezuelans uh, as well. And in one of the things that um, I've learned from you is that all of these and all of these transitions, they all during, while they happen, they always look like something that's never happened before. People tend to think, oh well, previous transitions, those were manageable, but this one is impossible. No, and so, and in, in in most cases, you know, people think that, and and uh, it's often not true that sooner or later there actually is a transition or some sort of return to democracy, and so. One of the things that uh, gets mentioned a lot, you know, when I talk about negotiations, is the level of criminality in Venezuela. You no, know? and, and that is that is something that's really significant. You no, know? and and I'm wondering, you know, compared to the cases that you you've looked at in the book with Sergio Vidal and 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 more broadly, you know, is this a difference? Uh, you know, often what you hear is is the issue of drug trafficking. It's a narco state, and that that I think you know, is often exaggerated. But what is, I think, even more important, though, is just regular opportunities for kickbacks and, and uh, corruption in a petro state. And we just this week have, you know, this emerging um, uh, case of, you know, what they're saying is $3 billion that are missing. And it's actually, 30, 30. most people seem to think it's much more than that, you know, more, more, most likely over 20. And so, you know, is is that a difference in your mind uh, uh, that makes the Venezuelan case more difficult? No. Does this mean that they have more interest in keeping this authoritarian government or context going uh, and and have more to lose and more sort of exit costs, or or is this not so different than communist Poland or apartheid South Africa? What, what, how, how do you think about this, or how should we think about this? Um, you're asking a good question that other people are asking as well. Uh, I will tr try to give my answer to it briefly, but I would start from the other end of the telescope. I would say Venezuela is certainly not the hardest case of uh, transition to democracy. Venezuela has enormous advantages over many of the cases that we study. It is more likely to be successful if it's approached properly and with a, a, a sufficient time frame. Why do I say that? First of all, because Venezuela has democratic uh, experience and traditions. Uh, it has the institutions and institutional memory 
uh, of how democratic governance works. Uh, and even today, after all of this and all of the disappointments, still Venezuelans believe in voting. Uh, you, Margarita was talking about public opinion polls and so on and so forth. Everything I've seen is that Venezuelans believe that they want to vote and they, they want to participate. Um, and it's uh, the institutions and, and sort of muscle memory is, is still there. Uh, it's also uh, true that uh, Venezuela uh, has resources and was a, quite a successful economy. Uh, it, I would think it'd be easier to reconstruct that than to go from the levels of poverty over uh, centuries and millennia that some of these countries have had to face. Uh, and it's in a good neighborhood for democratic governance. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, even uh, the, the emergence of people from the traditional Latin American left through democratic processes to gaining power uh, all around Venezuela uh, is another positive factor for Venezuela's chances. So I wouldn't underestimate the possibilities in Venezuela. And I think that's something that needs to be said and repeated and discussed because we're in a vicious circle where people are looking for all the explanations for failure uh, and thinking that it's impossible. Now, when it comes to, uh, there's no doubt a lot of corruption in, in Venezuela. And uh, very recently, the government has uh, at least begun to acknowledge uh, that they have big problems with uh, with corruption. I'm not sure of all of the reasons and all of the, the relationships that are involved here, but, you know, anecdotally one understands there's a good deal of corruption in, in Venezuela. I, uh, I have not seen uh, any uh, evidence that I found convincing that it was of an order of magnitude different from what has occurred historically and what has occurred in other countries in the contemporary situation. I mean, if you're talking about countries in, in Latin America, uh, you know, in, in, in Mexico and Honduras and Nicaragua, in, in, in uh, a number of cases. And by the way, just in one sentence, I would say we in the United States who are looking at various countries and gauging their level of corruption need to spend more time studying corruption in the United States, whether it be in finance or health or construction uh, or, or uh, high tech, uh, th there's a tremendous amount uh, that needs to, to be dealt with. So I think that it is, it is a challenge, it is an issue. I don't think it's uh, insurmountable. I think the questions are whether there are uh, reasons why the autocratic regime might uh, find advantages in moving toward democratic governance in a step-by-step -step, uh, basis uh, and if so whether there are ways the opposition can mobilize itself its supporters the venezuelan democratic population which still believes in democracy and the international uh, community in plausible and workable ways not expecting that some foreign power whether it's the united states or someone else is going to push a button and it suddenly will become democratic. I think the opposition made a serious mistake in depending uh, on, uh, on statements by President Trump that may have given them the impression the United States would solve the problem. I think that was irresponsible and damaging. But we're, we're, I think we understand that now, and it's a better way of approaching it. Yeah. Yes. Well, Professor Abraham, Oh, Abe, as they call you. Please. Um, I must recognize that I am pretty skeptical about the possibility at the moment of moving towards uh, a, a, a gradual negotiation with the, the Maduro dictatorship. All the things that I know, all the things that you have said, and you are right. But also, I think the magnitude, it's not only corruption, it's criminal organizations that have penetrated the state. It's the costs of the dictatorship to leave uh, power are very high. 
it's not only a, a, it's, it's an issue of human rights, it's an issue of interest, it's an issue of its allies with China, Russia, Iran, uh, Cuba. So, but I do believe that the, that, and, and with that I agree with you that really, uh, after the, the, the failure of the zero Zoom game, which as you say correctly, was very much backed by the United States and the administration of, of Donald Trump that gave hope to the opposition that that was going to happen and it didn't and it failed to happen after years investing in such a strategy. The, that the game right now, that the, the only viable and, uh, strategy, and I agree also desirable because it, it, it makes possible to build, to try to build a, a democratic political system is a gradual negotiated path. But I would like you, and in the book, I think you have a lot of, a lot of um, arguments about this, but specifically, it may not happen now, but it will have to happen in any case in Venezuela. There has to be a negotiation to get out of this situation. This is something that I think it can happen now or it can happen afterwards. But in any case, how do you visualize the first steps? I mean, when Maduro has stand out, stand up from the table once and again. He says one day that he likes negotiation, the next day he 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 insults. The, the opposition, and he walks out of the out of the uh, out of the room, his delegation, and the arguments can can be very very absurd to 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 get up from the table, but in any case, I say the day that they sit down, when that happens, what would be the first steps? What would you think? Uh, because in in the book, you you do say, well, there is an agenda, and actually the priorities are humanitarian relief for the Venezuelan people and building of the of the democratic institutions from down up, I would believe. How do you visualize these steps? Well, first of all, I, I want to start with your comment about uh, the comments that Maduro or others from the Venezuelan government make that go from one position to another. And there's lots of uh, things that are bothersome about that. I think one thing we, we have to learn from looking at other cases is that this always happens. That is, I don't know of a case where it, where it was just so smooth and it was clear that they were 100% on board with every step, one by one, going forward. No, there's always noise. There are always disagreements within the government. There's always... There's always tactical ways of trying to get the attention of the other side uh, when they're being uh, uh, un, uh, 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 unable to compromise and, and basically saying, you know, the, the heck with you, we don't need you, we'll do things our way. That, that's part of the game. You have to really uh, have a kind of level of patience, as well as confidentiality of the real discussions, which I think is an important advance in, uh, we don't know yet how, how successful it will be, but I think the fact of negotiations that uh, are not public, you know, there was at the very early stages, the first time there was a discussion of negotiation in Venezuela that I'm aware of, and I may not know of some pre previous to that, but I remember years ago, on the, on the eve of a, a so-called negotiation in Caracas, the opposition leadership made a public statement uh, insisting that these negotiations that were about to begin be televised. That, that told me, when, they, when, when that came out, it told me this is a, they don't have any intent of negotiating because you don't negotiate on television. That's not negotiation, that's theater. Um, so I think uh, we should try not to be uh, to, to give up too easily. I know that you've never given up. You're, uh, in fact, uh, I've been in this for a long time, Professor. <laughs> you, you've been admirably active and committed over a long period of time, and and an astute observer and analyst. I think your question is is exactly what we were driving at 
with the report Venezuela in 2023, 2023 and beyond charting a new course, which by the way is available easily to any one of your uh, watchers. Uh, it's on the website of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the Wilson Center. And it's not a book, it's, a, it's really a very concise 18-page uh, uh, report, uh, which deals with just the questions you're asking. Uh, I think the first place to begin has been begun, and that is moving toward working together, government and opposition, on an important humanitarian agenda uh, of really relieving distress and building uh, programs that improve the living situation of the great majority of Venezuelans who are uh, very badly hurt, as you described with, with statistics and so on. And so the pre-negotiations involving the international community and involving both the democratic opposition and the Maduro government has produced some agreement involving a United Nations fund, et cetera, uh, for the transfer of a considerable amount of resources uh, to be jointly administered uh, uh, by the government and, and opposition, not to the, the opposition resisting any cooperation with the government because the government is bad, nor vice versa, but rather they're really working on helping the Venezuelan people have a better situation. Those, th that, that agreement has not been uh, really implemented because it still has important reservations in terms of how the funding works uh, and the, the uh, legalities uh, of using the uh, source that was mentioned, which is frozen Venezuelan assets uh, in the U.S. financial system. But if the will is there, uh, it's something that both the opposition and the government stand to gain, and the Venezuelan people to absolutely to gain a great deal from the implementation of that agreement. So I think the first step is to work hard on getting that agreement in, into practice. I think there are other ways in which government and, and opposition can cooperate to solve problems and involve civil society, but also involve the, the uh, Venezuelan private sector, uh, which, I mean, they, all Venezuelans share some interests that they haven't been working on together because they've been trying to defeat each other. That's the zero sum that you mentioned. Uh, but if you move your mentality from zero sum to let's find out what is positive sum for sure, that anybody without a lot of study can tell you that it's better to improve the infrastructure than to destroy the infrastructure. It's better that there be uh, adequate nutrition than to starve everybody into uh, death or d disease or loss of, of mental capacity of young children and so on and so forth. These are not hard questions to know what to do, but both parties have resisted doing them together. So I, I would start with a great emphasis on that. I, I think the second thing is definitely to work on the uh, next uh, uh, round of elections at both the presidential and state and municipal level. And to make them as fair and as inclusive of uh, appropriate candidates as possible under the circumstances. How, how close they will come to perfection, I couldn't tell you. Do we have perfection in the United States? No, uh, but we have something that's a lot better than Venezuela has had recently. Uh, there, there's a lot that can be done. You have a, a National Electoral Commission, which has improved in, in its uh, composition and so on that can be part of it. But you, you need a combination of national and international pressure. Uh, one of the lessons, uh, you know, you, you were talking earlier about the dependence on the, on the international sector and, and on what Trump was promising and so on and so forth. Um, of all the cases we studied, there was an important international influence that helped the, the democratization process. And in not one of the cases was there even the threat 
let alone the fact of military intervention. So if somebody were studying that, they would have told you, and of course we did, <laughs> that you don't expect this is going to be solved by foreign military intervention. It just doesn't make sense that it's going to happen. So instead of that, I had discussions with some Venezuelan colleagues already several years ago in when, when it was very difficult to get basic goods into Venezuela and distributed properly. And, you know, this, this was being done by the, by the party of the, of the government, the distribution. I said, you know, I understand why they want to distribute it, because then their people will be grateful to them. But, you know, the private sector has a lot more experience at delivering goods efficiently than the, 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 the Socialist Party. Uh, the, the, the opposition should, should mobilize the private sector to offer its services to the government to work with the government to do this. And my Venezuelan interlocutor told me, no, absolutely no. We wouldn't want to do that at all because that would help the government accomplish what it needs to do. And that will strengthen the government. So no, let, let the people starve. Let's not offer that the private sector can help out. Well, maybe things have gotten to a different situation now. Yeah, where you there, there, is, there are some entrepreneurs inside the country that have that are negotiating inside yes. the council with the with the government. No, uh, David, do you want to say? Yeah, something? yeah, sure. Thank you. The um, it, you made a, in your first in your first comment, you made a, an interesting statement, a very important one uh, about the need for opposition unity, the need to gain some sort of unity within the opposition. Of course, this has been a long term uh, issue. I mean, since this report was, oh no, this was shortly before the the uh, you know one of the things that happened at the end of 2022 was that the interim government was was discontinued. No, and since then the opposition has been sort of slugging away trying to get to primaries, organized primaries, and so there are some in in my view the end of the interim government is a positive step. I think that gives it more clarity of purpose, and of course primaries. Um, are are very important as well. What uh, what other things uh, from the many cases you've studied? What other advice is there? Are mechanisms that have been used to try and gain this opposition unity? Because it's become clear that that is, you know, on one hand, there's an you know the opposition itself has this history, or the Venezuelan political elite has, or its traditional political elite has, a history of, of internal conflict. Um, but it's also very clear that the the government itself, you know, the Chavismo has made sort of an art of of di dividing the opposition, and so they have that against them. And so, what, you know, from from the different historical cases and your your understanding of the Venezuelan case, what what a, advice or what you know, what do you think they could do to try and become more united in in their in their struggle for democracy? Well, uh, that's a central question. Uh, I think you are really the person to answer it because you've uh, been, <laughs> been, been, been following this so closely. Uh, uh, I, I, I think you know, primaries will have uh, a short-term divisive effect. Uh, uh, that is, if you put people into competition in, in primaries, they will be uh, you know, trying to develop their constituencies and, and the, the, the divisions may be sharpened. But if, if you can sort of get enough dialogue going within Venezuela to understand it, th th there's going to be some short-term frictions because if you're competing for recognition and, and for position and for uh, a place on the ballot and so on, you know, th th there's going to be some there's some cost to that in terms of uh, short-term unity. Uh, but if you develop a, a mentality through dialogue and discussion that, okay, this is our shot uh, to get, to become more competitive in the electoral arena, uh, we need to agree, and we need to agree in a plausible and convincible and credible way that once the primaries have been conducted and resolved, we will all support the resulting winners, and we will go all out, as was done years ago already when Teodoro Petkoff helped to put together, you know, United uh, 
uh, uh, ballot uh, uh, combinations and so on. Uh, in the in the years since then, the opposition has been ambivalent about whether to participate in elections at all. Well, you're not going to win elections by not participating. And you may not win elections right away, even by participating actively and in a united way. I can't promise you that that's how the elections will come out with a sweeping uh, opposition victory. But you're much more likely to get there over time if you do, if you compete, if you compete effectively, if you produce uh, a, a real on the ground presence uh, uh, of people who are doing things to advance the country and who are sub making subservient their individual ambitions to the broader uh, uh, democratic outcome. And so it's a step by step. And this next step is very important. Uh, and I, I mean, I, any thoughts you have as to how to how to pull that off, how to get that dialogue to have that outcome, uh, the role of civil society as well as parties. I think that's that's something we could contribute a great deal through your intervention in a positive way on, on the question you yourself have raised. <laughs> Want to do that, David? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I I think I I sort of already did in the sense that you know I think I think it's quite good that uh, the 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 figure of the interim government has been discontinued because I thought that was a factor that really sort of diminished its clarity of the clarity of purpose. And you would have on the one hand you would have the the unitary platform negotiating uh, with one set of ideas, and then you would have members of the of the interim government saying quite different things in Washington and abroad, uh, you know, in, in one hand saying, OK, well, let's go to regional elections in 2021. And then you have Leopoldo Lopez saying, well, actually, I wouldn't vote in them because I don't trust these elections. And so, you know, I think that that's a, a really positive thing. And I think that um, the that is going to help. It's going to help because that also sort of prevented the renewal of of opposition leadership. And I think going to primaries is the right thing. I think uh, having this divisive moment of going to primaries is a good thing and that coming up with a candidate. We'll see, you know, if if they actually pull it off to the point that candidate, the losing candidates recognize. You know, there's sort of a tradition of, of preferring to go down in flames than recognizing your loss. And so hopefully, know the who whatever candidates right and left in the opposition that do not win the primaries will recognize and that would be key because i think you know there's in, in in venezuela right now we're at a very passive moment you know you walk around caracas and nobody nobody talks about politics nobody's very interested but that's largely because of the fact that they don't have any hope they don't think that the government is really going to do right by them and they don't think the opposition has the ability to dislodge the government or provide something better, no. But I think if there if there is a, a uni, unified candidate, I think almost virtually any candidate, uh, a unified candidate and a process, and this is probably the more difficult part, a process that they actually trust, no, and they think that they can vote. I mean, I think you would have participation immediately. I think there'd be massive participation if they believed in the process and if there's actually a unified opposition. But um, but, you know, those are it, it's tough. The you know, I think, yeah. of I course, think the government is always going to try and divide the opposition. But that's that's the way you play ball. That's the play, way you play politics. And they're going to do that. So I think the opposition has to try and uh, do that. Shoot, I think we just lost Margarita. Um, well, uh, as while uh, Margarita is um, getting back on, because I think she just uh, uh, dropped off let let me just go to another question that i had and uh you know in the question i i have or what i've been thinking about oh, quite a bit in the past year is you know how you know whether the term transition is really the right term you no know? and i mm -hmm. i've just sort of gotten away from talking about transition i just talk about democratization you know mm -hmm. in in and and working to open democratic spaces because you know the, the idea of transition uh, always 
uh, you know, sort of indexes a turning point, like at a certain point where it's going to be like, oh, the government's going to fall and there's going to be ticker tape parade in the streets and uh, the opposition's going to take charge. But I think that's just not really what's going to happen. I can't see, I can't imagine that happening. What I can imagine happening is, you know, a step-by-step uh, sort of negotiation or a step-by-step opening. And I think, you know, uh, there's actually in the literature, there's there's some, um, there, there are some interesting twists, you know, if, you, if there's a, there was a recent, I don't know if you saw this, uh, a review article by Rydell, Slater, Wong, and Ziblatt um, that that said basically authoritarians, and it's spoken in terms of democratization, authoritarians democratize when they have to, no, when there's so much pressure that they that they um, have no choice, or because when doing so, they face little risk. And so the case would be like Ghana and in Taiwan, in which there was democratization because authoritarians felt so, so uh, strong that they didn't feel threatened, so they democratized. Um, you know, and, and I think Venezuela is not really clearly in either case. No, the the opposition of, is very weak, and I think Maduro feels pretty strong, but he doesn't feel that confident that he can just democratize, and in particular because I think he knows he would lose an election. And so, I, you know, just your observations, Abe, and, and sort of what moment we're in. You no, know, are we in a transition moment? Are we in a democratization moment? Or, you know, how should we think about what we're working for or, or what, what's realistic in this context? I, I think your comment about uh, democratization or the development and strengthening of democratic institutions, whether that be re-institutionalization or simply institutionalization uh, is, a, is a better uh, short term than transition for uh, the process we're talking about. I, 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 I take your point. Uh, I'm probably t- too wedded to the uh, transition uh, uh, phrase. It, it has a prehistory going back, as Margarita was mentioning, to the O'Donnell Schmitter Whitehead uh, project, which I, I was involved in. So it's probably too embedded. <laughs> um, but uh, I think you make a, a point Although, of course, my own definition of transition uh, is one that uh, involves stages over, over time uh, rather than expectation of an easy and quick uh, moment of, you know, black turns to white or white turns to black uh, uh, with a flip of a switch. Um, uh, that still, you know, leaves the issue of uh, whether it's plausible that there are an, enough incentives for the authoritarian regime to move in a direction that is more conducive to an eventual uh, democratic governance uh, approach. If it's conducive to a less authoritarian approach uh, to uh, greater spaces, uh, to more effective participation, uh, greater freedoms, uh, more ability for both political and business entrepreneurship to occur, et cetera. If it, if it, if it de-authoritarian, you know, reduces the authoritarian aspects and expands democratic space, that's worth doing. Uh, on its own merits. And it also, I, in my view, increases the likelihood that uh, it will go farther over time as the, dy- as the dynamics change, as different actors have more confidence that it's worth e- expending energy and resources in moving forward. And so your point about the passivity uh, and pessimism, you know, it's that, that's something that has to be fought against uh, because you're not going to get anywhere in, in the direction that w- w- we all want uh, by passivity and and uh, uh, it is perfectly understandable to be discouraged but many important things in life from the most intimate of personal life details to 
national and global directions to climate change or anything else, uh, getting defeatist about it is not going to solve the problem. You, you have to somehow mobilize your energy to see what is plausible and work on that. Uh, and I think step by step uh, is worth doing on its own merits, and it does increase the likelihood of get of going farther. Kidding. I'm having trouble with internet, believe it or not. I, this is the first time that this happens to me. But we're about to close, but I just wanted to point out a couple of things before we leave. I hope I can stay on the stream for at least the two minutes to close. First, that we were talking about the efforts that the politicians have to do and the negotiation table, and, and we have seen all those prospects, but we haven't mentioned, or we haven't mentioned it that much, the, the role of so, civil society and citizenship. Yeah. This is very, very important. I mean, they actually have been moving the politicians into a gradual and negotiated path. I mean, because they, they, they were stuck, the politicians of, of the Democratic parties were stuck in this zero sum game uh, and fighting among them for leadership in that if something happened, they all always underestimated the, 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 the capacities of the dictatorship. And so it was really actors of civil society. And, uh, and also, we have to say, some politicians and some political parties that have moved now the, the strategy into shaping this new way, this new path. And so, and, but it's not only them, it has to be the citizens also especially those that, that are still uh, aware of politics or are still interested in politics, that they have to have uh, some awareness that the only way out of this situation is a big effort on the part of all society. And having said that, I would say that the negotiation path, and I, I would like to, this would be the last minutes, uh, is always going to be there because we have to go out in a negotiated way, even if because of the nature of the regime, something unexpected can happen. I mean, we're right now we're seeing something, right? We're seeing this terrible accusations among them of, of stealing money, disappearing money from after the, the oil company is in absolute bankrupt. It's, and they just looted completely the oil industry, no? And so there's a vulnerability. So you don't know what's the development of that. Maybe nothing happens and they just rearrange again and they keep on going. But un if something unexpected, unexpected happens, the path has to be clear. The negotiation path has to be there in order to advance. Because that is the Venezuelan history. When Marcos Perez Jimenez, our other last dictator in, of the 20th century, flew with his plane out of Caracas, immediately the negotiations started that same day, negotiating to bring the civilians into the government. So I think those are the two scenarios that we have. We have to be working on that negotiated path, gradual from the down up and from the up down uh, dynamics, but we have to also be prepared for the unexpected because as, as uh, uh, some authors have said, Linz, Juan Linz, for example, and Alfred Stefan, this kind of regimes usually fall when, you, when, you, when you're not looking, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> unexpectedly and sometimes violently. I think your comments are extremely important, both on civil society and, and on this last point about surprise. Fernando Enrique Cardoso, in his interview with us in that book, he put it this way, when the inevitable seems about to happen, that's when the unexpected occurs. Okay, I think we've had a, a very nice chat. I really thank you, Professor Lovetal and David, uh, for, for, this, for this conversation. And we keep on talking and we keep on doing efforts. Thank you very much and take care of yourselves. Thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, thanks, Abe. And th thanks and good luck at the conference. Okay, thank you. Thank you.